Go ahead and get started. Ready? Yeah. Okay. We're calling the 385th meeting of the College Place Planning Commission to order. Mr. Rick, will you please do the roll call? Ken Lauterbach? Here. Brian Rose? Present. Eileen Davis? Absent. Mike Boyman? Here. Randall Brandis Moreau is absent. Scott Duncan? Here. Dennis Olson? Here. Yeah. Thank you. So I understand we're going to start today with some open public comment. Is this Mr. Green? Yeah, so we're going to be pretty informal. Usually we try to keep it to five minutes. Um, I would ask you to be relatively brief because we do have a full agenda and I want to hear about our field trip that I missed last time. And uh, so, um, but yes, please, please share your thoughts and again, start with your name and address. Thank you. Stanley Green, Field Box 95, College Place. And I've lived in College Place a total of nearly 30 years in two different blocks of time. And um, I'm a graduate of the Edward F. Cross School here. And, um, and I have an academic and professional background in transportation engineering. So just to give you some background as to why I'm focusing on what I am. But, so um, I was one of the two um, non-planning commissioners on the tour last week, which I found very informative. And I was a member of this commission in the mid-1990s when we were adopting the comprehensive plan to be, make it in conformance with the Growth Management Act. That was also when um, the Meadowbrook development was coming up and a few other major projects. So I know you're going to be looking at subdivisions and I want to comment a little bit about residential as well as commercial um, design guidelines. So, and some of this is a critique of some things I wish we would have done better 20 some years ago. So for example, with commercial, one of my major critiques of the way the Meadowbrook Business District is now is that like too many suburban commercial developments of the late 20th century, it has what is a de facto street grid with what are actual streets that aren't actually laid out as streets or with the infrastructure of streets. There's even a traffic signal on one of these non-street streets. So there's no name. You can't say I'm standing at the corner of Meadowbrook and, uh, well, I'm outside, you know, whatever business. So please give them names, make sure they have sidewalks, and make sure that they function well for what they actually are. They're streets, and let's call them that. Um, in residential areas, we talked on the tour a little bit about different developments and whether they have sidewalks or not. And so in the late 1950s, early 1960s, it was too common to not have sidewalks and to design only for the automobile. So for example, over around Tremont, Ivy, and A Street, that's an example of that at the west end of A Street. And I've spent a lot of time in that neighborhood over many, many years. Um, family and friends live there. I live, ne I live nearby many years and go there frequently still. I don't feel entirely safe walking there because of the way the sight lines are. Whereas in Garrison Creek Villages, on the main collector going through there, there are sidewalks and beautiful street trees, but on the side streets, there are generally no sidewalks, but there are alleys which take some of the automobile traffic. There is a supplementary pedestrian network, so that relatively little driving is done on the streets without sidewalks, and a moderate amount of walking. And I feel perfectly safe walking on those streets because of the way they're laid out, their width, their sight lines. So a basic of traffic engineering and transportation engineering and planning is a social science. You're predicting human behavior. You make a street straight with clear sight lines and wide. The straighter, the wider, the clearer the sight lines, the heavier the right foot of the driver. So if you make the street narrower, you have the landscaping such that it gives a sense of pedestrian scale, and you make sure the sight lines are adequate to see people walking or motor vehicles, but not such that somebody feels like they, they can just floor it for a good straight you know, drag race, then it can be safe for automobiles, for people bicycling, and people walking. 
that's way more effective than speed bumps or stop signs every 45 feet or any number of other so-called traffic calming measures. The design of the street is your best traffic calming measure. And I'd like for you to give, I know you've given some thought to this, but I'd like you to give thought to how will people who live here be able to access other neighborhoods where their friends or their children's playmates might live, the schools, places they might want to shop, where they're going to catch transit service, or how they'll get to what is a developing bicycle pedestrian network in the region. So that the distances that a person has to walk or bicycle, A, are not too far, and B, are very attractive. And I'm sure you already know this, but those kinds of facilities are not merely recreational facilities, they're also transportation facilities, they're public health facilities, and they're economic development facilities. If you look at any real estate advertisements anywhere, <coughs> proximity to good walking and bicycling trails is something that any real estate agent is going to say is a positive feature of this home or this neighborhood. So it's an investment in the community's future, it's not a waste of money or a waste of land. And you know, again, I'm sure you know this, but I tell you I had to really try to be persuasive on this back in the mid-1990s and earlier in my career. So I, I'm, I'm just really encouraged by the overall direction you're taking, and I just want to really cheer you on to make sure that there's really good connectivity for people walking and bicycling, connecting to transit, connecting to where people want to shop. I'm sure many of you have heard of walkability stores. There are places on the internet where you can put in a neighborhood and see what the walkability score is. And there are a whole lot of people these days who want to live someplace with a high walkability score. So let's keep moving forward on making College Place a place that's attractive for people, that has good automobile circulation, but also has really good health and circulation for transit, bicycling, walking, and our friends and neighbors in wheelchairs. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have a question for sure. you. With your expertise in transportation engineering, could you talk to us a little bit about collectors, major collectors, arterials, the speed that they should be, and possibly maybe not having sidewalks on some of those streets. Okay, so <laughs> just as a wide street street makes the driver's right foot heavier, a higher classification in that scheme can make city officials drool over the additional funding they'll get from state and federal agencies. And so there are too many streets that are classified too high on that scheme because of the perverse incentives that have been offered for decades by state and federal agencies. And, and I'm not saying anything about any specific individuals in the city of College Place. This is a general trend. I can give the same comment in any planning commission across the country. And so, certainly if it's something classified higher than a residential street, it absolutely should have sidewalks regardless of the other design criteria. Um, and again, having sidewalks is better than not having sidewalks, and if you're in doubt about whether the design criteria make it safe to not have sidewalks, I would err in favor of having sidewalks, just so you know. But, like I say, if you haven't, I really encourage you to walk on the side streets in Garrison Creek Villages and walk on the paths there and get a sense of whether you feel safe walking there. And think about what are the characteristics that make it feel safe. And if the developer is coming up with those kinds of design criteria, then maybe it's okay to not have sidewalks. But also, go for a walk on the west end of A Street and up Tremont or Ivy or something like that and especially the curve from A to Tremont. Walk both directions around that curve and think about which side of the street you want to be walking on and why, because of sight lines. So um, I really encourage people to get out and do things firsthand. And by the way, if you haven't ridden buses around this 
community, get out and ride buses and get a sense of what it's like to wait for a bus in different places here and what kind of signage exists in different places because that's part of the overall mobility equation of this community. Thank you. Mr. Rickard, may I ask about the history of, of Meadowbrook with the street naming? Well, <clears throat> Meadowbrook was in place prior to my coming to college place, but um, there, there actually we're, we're in review of a binding site plan for the vacant portion behind the, the two strip malls there. And their, their proposal is for that intersection to continue the street, the street uh, to continue through to Larch. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm gathering that we likely will have to come up with a name for that because Stanley's correct, it, it, especially once it connects through to Larch, it will most certainly function as a, as a de facto uh, street. Already does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So is that, <clears throat> that just kind of a, I don't know, an odd occurrence that is unlikely to develop again, or is that something that is needing further modification? Um, I think the location of the intersection developed from the requirement of, from WashDOT for the entrance into Walmart to be a certain distance from the intersection of the highway and Meadowbrook. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a right in, right out in, into Walmart, and it's signed that there's no left hand turn movement when you're heading north on Meadowbrook, but people make that turn movement all the time and, and work around the pork chop. Um, uh, so most of the traffic is, is by design was supposed to go to the, to the traffic signal there, and that's why there's a light there. Um, but yeah, it's not a there's no street. I mean, so. And John, if I could add something, there are going to be some provisions in the regulations that we'll be discussing with you that touch upon some aspects of that. The specific design of a, of a development may be the function of what the project sponsor, his development team, and others like the Department of Transportation require. But from a city standpoint, kind of starting with the discussion of private streets are discouraged but not prohibited, and then the discussion we've been having about under what circumstances might private streets be permitted, and also kind of recognizing that a private street does not mean a lesser standard, it just means who has ownership and maintenance responsibilities. We could get to the point of things like binding site plans, commercial developments, where streets and internal access and parking lots, the lines get a little bit blurred, but making sure that adequate provisions for safety are addressed, regardless of who's ultimately responsible for plowing the snow, for instance, is an important consideration. So it's kind of a, a long trail, but we will be touching upon some of the things uh, that you raise in this speaker raise when we go through the, the regulations. And sorry to keep chasing this rabbit hole, but where did we actually end up within the urban comprehensive plan on private streets? Is it, was it worded as discouraged, or did we end up prohibiting that? Discouraged. Oh, discouraged. All right, thank you. Um, any other commissioner comments before we move on to our regular agenda? No? Okay. So we'll do the uh, consent agenda which is the approval of today's agenda, as well as the minutes from the last two meetings, uh, both our regular one and our field trip. So are there any comments or questions about that? If not, I have a motion for approval. So moved. Uh, moved by Commissioner Duncan. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Olson. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah, I heard three eyes. Is that right? Abstain. And we'll have, can we have two abstentions? Or do we need to have four for the, for the motion to pass? Yeah, I'll, I'll share that I'm not comfortable approving a field trip minutes 
but I did not attend. So if you'll prove the meeting you were at, I'll prove the meeting I was at, and then we'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. There's, there's nothing in the bylaws that, uh, that prohibits somebody that was not in attendance from voting on approving minutes. So. Yes, you have shared that before, and I <laughs> stand by my statement that I'm not comfortable okay, with I'm such <laughs> what I was not in attendance of. But between Brian and I, Swinging our boats appropriately, I think we're we're good there. So, did we catch all that? Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, let's move to our active agenda. Um, the first item being subdivision regulations. Is that going to be you, Mr. Dolan? Thank you. Yeah. Let me move this up a little bit closer. Oh, that's fine. I think this. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the record. My name is Greg Dorn, and I've been working with you on updating the comprehensive plan and now updating the city's development regulations. The first item we on the agenda tonight is we just wanted to spend some unstructured time providing commissioners, guests, with an opportunity to share your thoughts and impressions and what you found noteworthy during the tour. And uh, Following that, we have some specific questions that we'd like to ask you, but we'd like to start with uh, just an informal discussion, invite any of the commissioners to um, um, share some of the thoughts and impressions you had. The purpose of the tour was to provide an opportunity to see subdivisions of different age or vintage, subdivisions that were approved according to different standards, and subdivisions uh, that were approved by different jurisdictions. So an opportunity to see City of College Place, City of Walla Walla, Walla Walla County, an opportunity to see some relatively new subdivisions and some that have had an opportunity to age for up to 100 years. So we saw a pretty uh, full continuum. Um, I'll share just one observation that I had, which was I found the, the tour extremely well organized and, and uh, tremendously insightful. I saw a lot of things that I found very interesting. Um, planners tend to be a little bit goofy that whole way, um, but um, I really enjoyed it. Engineers too. <laughs> yeah, John, I'd really like to get hear some of your impressions. So, it, it, Mr. A, however you'd like to do that, but we would like to, to hear from each and every one of you some of the things that you thought were noteworthy and don't hesitate to discuss among yourselves. We're going to be listening to what we hear you say. And Mr. Green, if you have comments yes, too, yeah. we'd be interested in hearing those as well. Thank you. John, you want to start us off? Oh, well, I... You don't want to bias the... Yeah, I don't want to bias the... That's thoughtful of you. Very good. <laughs> I think one of the one of the neatest things that I did see and that was pointed out regularly was the area for um, planters or the, the the planting spots and I think especially on an arterial I think that should be a vital component to what we do. Um, it seemed to make all of the neighborhoods we went in there that had trees and those planting spots much nicer neighborhoods and much more inviting. I guess I'll, right. I'll just second that comment. I appreciate the planting strips and what they added to the neighborhoods, uh, and also in providing probably safer transit on sidewalks, uh, a, a gap between the streets and the sidewalks. And separation. Right. That's right. Uh, something else I was intrigued by was was on street parking and uh, properly providing for it. I, I don't know that I saw a particular neighborhood that was. I, I guess I didn't design identify a design feature that enabled or or did a poor job of that, but I think it's important to consider. I, I know Hayden Homes, I think, uh, in particular, or their, their development up on the hill struggles uh, with lack of on-street parking. So. I think we talked about the frontage lot size being one of the major factors, being the fact that the driveway is in, the, in that 20-foot range. Is that what you were telling us? That you typically like to see a driveway no longer, no wider than a 20 foot range. But if the street frontage is only a 50 foot gap of width anyway, then there's almost no street parking available on those. Uh, Carver is the, is the street that is the, the most egregious one in, uh, that I think we saw anywhere. Carver was just horrible. There was. Where's Carver? Uh, it's in the, the Homestead area, and if you drive the first one, it's the 
second main right. All of the lots are 3,600 square foot. Some of them on one end only have one car garages, on the other end there are two car garages, and there's just no place to park on the street. And we even have signs that say you can't park on the street if you're a resident. <laughs> Which, you know, is kind of counterintuitive because it's the residents that typically have two and three cars. So. Yeah. I will say that's the first time I have seen a sign like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're also raising some interesting questions about how it would ever be enforced, but it, but it is unique, at least to me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to focus. Well, <clears throat> I can agree with this. the planning strips but my concern is who's responsible and how it's maintained because if it's totally on the, on the uh, ownership, that could be plus or minus. Yeah, I think we saw examples of both where the, the adjoining property owner took pride in it and then there were others that city's responsibility and it and looked like it was the city's responsibility. <laughs> On some of the yeah. areas can be a parking spot. Yeah, yeah. Some instances, yeah, the required landscaping or strip whatever due to lack of maintenance or maybe just uh, um, um, property owner initiative, they were converted to parking areas, hmm. formally or informally. And other areas um, where there were planning strips but no sidewalks. In the older areas, uh, seem to be developed so that you know it's a, a cozy, friendly type area. I know the one area in that petition that we went through. There are no sidewalks there. For the most part, the streets are visible. I mean, the sight lines are visible, but there are problems with that too. But I think all the lots were adequate size. So, of course, I like my subdivision. <laughs> <laughs> it has the sidewalks, but it, it does not have planting strips. So I think, for me, that's an advantage. Stanley Green, with regard to planting strips or no, and who has maintenance responsibility. This comment is especially true in a commercial district. Um, I had a meeting with some other people, with some Washington DOT active transportation officials a couple of months ago in Walla Walla about 9th Avenue, but you could say something similar about College Avenue. And that is that if the government agency doesn't take responsibility for the sidewalk, it's a message that that transportation function is of lesser importance. So for example, 9th mm -hmm. Avenue is a state highway, but the state's responsibility is from curb face to curb face. But you can say College Avenue is a city street, but is the city responsible for the sidewalk? If you try to walk on some of these streets or get off a bus in the winter, and snow may, the, the, the business may have plowed their driveway snow onto the sidewalk, and you wouldn't get away with doing that to the traveled roadway. The city wouldn't get away at an intersection with leaving a big, huge berm of snow blocking, say, 12th Street when they plowed College Avenue, at least not for more than a few minutes. So by having the property owner responsible for the sidewalk, you're saying that the people who are using the sidewalk, that transportation function is a lower priority, it's a secondary status to people who are using the asphalt roadway. Um, a point about, I don't know if you're into this, but in the subdivision regulations, I saw six feet wide sidewalks, no obstructions, well, sometimes something that might be considered an obstruction like a street light or whatever might be necessary. I would really encourage you to define the regulations in terms of effective width of a sidewalk. There is engineering literature on that, and, and rather than using gross width of the sidewalk, 
use a minimum effective width, and that takes into consideration obstructions, whether the sidewalk is right next to a curb or next to a wall and other factors like that. Other thoughts and comments? And some of these points we're going to come back to and further discuss, but like I say we want to get what did you carry away from the from the tour? All right, John, your turn. <laughs> well, uh, oh, go ahead, Scott. I was just going to comment. <clears throat> we saw some vacant areas without sidewalks within the development that had sidewalks. Um, Bliss was one. I took the, the <clears throat> liberty to go the, to the one that we didn't go to. And there were at least two lots there that are not fulfilled with sidewalks because there's no, no building on the properties at this point. So I notice in the regulations you're trying to, to close that gap, uh, which I think would be well because we walk in bliss and so we have to go out in the street to, to walk around that property. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about that once more. Any other <laughs> comments? John, a couple of any impressions you want to share? Well, I think a lot, I shared a lot of them as I kind of guided the tour as we went along, but in your echoing a lot of a lot of the um, the same things that I mentioned, and um, I, don't, I I see the public realm as an investment in the community, and it reflects on uh, the adjacent properties. So um, if if you have a well-built public environment, I believe that that you will, over the course of many, many years, have uh, stronger property values. Um, and I think you see that if you go into some of the older cores of Walla Walla, uh, you know, you've got community neighborhoods that are, you know, pushing, you know, 100 years, maybe even a little bit older. And those, those areas that uh, where the forefathers of Walla Walla uh, really made sure that there was significant right of way which has a cost today, but in the long run, uh, there's a payback, and we need to think about the payback of that cost today because, uh, you know, our children and grandchildren are going to hopefully come back and be in our community and raise families here, and uh, the developers are only here today to build those subdivisions, and they're gone. Um, we're, we're left with their legacy, and so your legacy could be the standards that we set. Um, so I would encourage you to think about the long-term cost, not just today, because that, and that wasn't brought up by any of your, your comments today, but I, I often hear, well, we have to think about, um, you know, if, are the developers gonna build here if our standards are too high? And I think there's truth to that. If you go, you know, totally bonkers, then, you know, if we ask for gold streets or, you know, they're not going to come, but um, I think there's some there's a balance that we need to we need to come up with. I believe that I saw a much more personal view of a, a, a private owner's property on streets that had trees that had the the planted strips that had wide enough roads mm -hmm. to where they were comfortable to drive on, regardless of who was parking in the street or not. And I don't care what age we were at, whether it be a 100-year-old um, uh, street or a 20-year-old street. It seemed to be that way no matter what. The homes, people just took, take care of their stuff better when it looks nicer overall. And, uh, and I, I know that I, I beat the small minimum lot size, the small lot size thing a whole lot. But I think Carver is a perfect example of what happens when you allow lot sizes to get too small. It's a junky street, and it's almost new, and it's already a junky street. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Any other thoughts or comments? We're going through some stormwater changes, regulations. Is there, 
requirements that that entails that would also require curb and gutter, or is it still possible that we would develop uh, residential neighborhoods without? Um, so Greg and I met with Robert this afternoon and that was a discussion and I, um, there are many ways that you know you can deal with stormwater and there are many street standards that you can come up with uh, that work with that and and one um, one thought we are contemplating is is the use of that uh, planting strip may also depending on the soils and and the design it could be a swale um, but I, but I wanted to make sure when it, that we would also be able to incorporate trees into that and obviously trees in the bottom of the swale doesn't work from an engineering standpoint on treating water and but um, if <clears throat> there is the option to come up with a standard where there is a raised section you know periodically as you go through the streetscape where you could have those trees at a higher elevation um, and also staff believes that there is a distinction between an urban standard and a rural standard and um, and there are also protections that curbs provide and it, it seems to be that uh, at least from staff's point of view is that we want to preserve the urban standard which is generally a curb um, you can have you know uh, scuppers in that to allow water to flow into treatment swales and whatnot but the rural standard really is you know you don't have you don't have the curb you have ditches and uh, and in most cases, you don't even have sidewalks when you get out into the county. So, well, and if the sidewalk is there, it's the same level as the asphalt. <coughs> right. <coughs> also, part of our discussion was that let's be clear about what we're trying to accomplish. If we have a specific standard in mind or a specific outcome that's desired, then let's be clear about what that is. If we are see alternative paths and they're okay then let's make sure that we're okay with the alternative paths because if so, we give somebody three choices and they pick option number three and we say oh we don't like that <laughs> choice then let's not give it to them <laughs> otherwise we need to accept it and we saw some of that on on the tour where we saw things and we maybe looked at it and said oh, that's not what i would do to landscape that strip well, we either have to accept it because somebody did something different, or if we don't want it that way, then say it's not acceptable. So we've had some discussions internally about what is it that we're really trying to accomplish, and some of those questions we're going to put to you as we go along. Yeah. So. Another thing I would add to that conversation is that from Rock, our city engineer, Robert Gordon's perspective, is the less standards that he has, the easier it is for him, the one person that's reviewing these plans, to, to go through that process and also to communicate that to the developers. Uh, developers do like consistency. So if you can say, this is our standard right here on this page, or uh, it, it's a lot easier for them to develop their uh, portfolios for whether or not a project's gonna work for them, um, rather than say, well, here's the a la carte, and, and then, like Greg was saying, well, but we really don't like this one here, and you know, yeah. Stormwater is the one area where what happens in the future may represent a departure from what you've seen in the past because the state has new standards and they're imposing them on jurisdictions and the city is going to be in instituting a stormwater utility and so there are is going to be some changes to regulations in the stormwater area that will definitely ripple through. I question on the same line. Yeah, I'll have one more, go ahead. one more finishing statement for me, I guess, and, no, then, go and ahead. then I'll certainly turn it over to you. So, yeah, I, I like what I think I'm hearing from our response in, in that regard. And I, I like the curb and gutter. I like the fact that it provides a definitive boundary to the roads so that we don't have the undesirable parking on the fringe of the street impacting the potential landscaping. I like the separation it provides for pedestrians. There's a sidewalk there. And I think that the stormwater changes that we're currently going through are an opportunity to guide our development in that aspect as well. So um, now that I've said my piece. <laughs> well, first off, I'll second that. I think everything you said is accurate, and to my opinion, too. 
I have a question about stormwater treatment in the old part of town. Everything from college to, to large is anywhere from 70 to you know, 50, 60, 70 years old. What kind of stormwater access, is, how do you deal with stormwater in those areas currently? Well, currently where, they're, where, where we have catch basins, most in the old core, they, are, they all somehow make their way to the creeks um, through pipes. And uh, I believe as we work through redevelopment of those, we are supposed to eliminate those. And maybe, Monty, you might be able to chime in a little bit more. It's not my area of expertise, but um, the, the long- them going to the creeks? Eliminate surface water outfall, yes. yes. So the desire is to infiltrate that. You, they, the they, you so need to have treatment prior to release to, to streams. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a problem. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's, I take it, some kind of genius idea from the state level? Yep. Federal. Oh, it's even more. Federal and yeah. trickles down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Washington State administers that. Uh, Clean Water Act requirement for us. And it's mostly unmandated, unfunded mandated. Unfunded mandated, not unmandated. Now, no, there are some, <laughs> uh, to jump ahead and then we'll come back, but there are, there are some factors that, that kind of drive that. Um, uh, both Spokane and the city of Portland are two recent examples where they have done major, major retrofits or, or adaptations of their system because they were collecting storm water um, with curbs and, and gutters and it was going into their sanitary sewer system and when you'd get significant um, um, storm events you would have a, a surge and more um, flow than they had the capacity in the in the sewage uh, treatment plan, I would take students on a tour of the Spokane sewage treatment facility and we would stand at the point of diversion and we'd stand there and say, when more water can go through here, and you could look and they would look over and just kind of the yuck factor as they saw kind of the toilet paper hanging from the branches on the side of the Spokane River and could see and visualize raw sewage going right into the Spokane River, that kind of made an impression to them. Or in the case of in eastern Washington, where we tend to have more inclement weather and we use salts and chemicals, collecting water from the street and discharging right into creeks would be problematic. So there are some environmental factors, but there is also the reality of the development that's already occurred and the investments that have already been made. And you know, kind of the, the, how do you make all of that work? That's going to be the kind of the, the new element in this discussion uh, for the city because some of the things that we're able to do in the past won't be able to do. Can they be done in a way that is kind of reasoned and balanced and fits within the overall thing? That might be where some of the challenge is. Any other things? Did anybody have kind of a as we went through the valley and did our circle, was there any kind of impressions as we went through that kind of came full circle? Did you see any that trying to not lead you on too much? Or, <laughs> but, I think you better start leading. Because <laughs> I ain't got a clue where you're coming. Well, to. Sure, so. Are you on the trip? Mm -hmm. you have anything you want yeah. to share? I'd like to yeah, you're on the you. trip. Um. Please. <laughs> Um, I noticed the planting strips also and what Scott was saying about the vacant lots and how the sidewalks just stopped at that point. Um, I noticed how um, narrow the streets were in downtown Walla Walla where we were at. So I guess what I was kind of getting at was we, we started out in College Place and, you know, we looked out at an empty field and that, you know, I, I had a built neighborhood over there in my head. I don't know about you guys. But, um, <laughs> and then we, you know, went through Scott's neighborhood and it's a very well maintained neighborhood um, and it has our traditional, you know, curb type sidewalk system and adequate parking um, 
decent sized lots and uh, and then we you know slowly went through and and then we started moving into the Walla Walla area where we we started to see uh, planting strips on one side with sidewalks on both sides but one side was curved tight and I thought oh this maybe is a good compromise but um, and don't take don't be a take this as a, an offense to our our neighborhoods or anything but as I started as we started to go into the neighborhoods that had this the the, the planting strips I, I oh I like this better you know I like the look of this um, and then we got into planting strips on both sides and and then we got into the old core of Walla Walla and I you know there's Alvarado Terrace I think is a beautiful street um, you know big huge trees and, uh, and then we got back into College Place and then you know we drove down Whitman and it was super narrow there were sidewalks but it was it was just didn't when I envisioned myself walking I was, I was like I don't want to walk on this street and then of course we have missing sidewalk on that street and then we got up to the Hayden Homes development and you know there was no street trees and and then the narrow lots and the lots of driveways and lots of garages and not much house um, I just kind of had a sense of that maybe the direction that College Place has been going is 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 not hasn't is not good for our, our long-term longevity of our community and I don't know if anybody else kind of had that feel um, but I want to change that that's me I work for you guys so Mr. Green's gonna chime in in a minute and I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in front just like I did with Ken um, one of the things that I've noticed too in working at Hayden Homes I'm sorry that I missed the, the field trip because it sounds like it was really good but when we have the sidewalk that's curb tight the American Disability Act the ADA requirements require that those driveways be basically flat and level so you have the sidewalks that are curb height and then you transition down to the driveway, flat and level, and then back up and then down for the driveway. And because the spacing is so tight, as, as Ken mentioned, you're up and down all over the place with those curb type sidewalks. Whereas if you have the planter strip and you have five, six feet separation, then that sidewalk can be continuously level. The throw of the driveway transitions from street level to the sidewalk, which is six foot behind. And it's just continuous and it's very easy walking. Whereas going with that curb tight mm -hmm. with tight plot spacings, it's challenging mm -hmm. for perfectly able people to mm -hmm. walk on ADA compliant required sidewalk heights. Yeah, thank you for so, pointing that out because it. Um, and if you're on a bicycle, much much worse. Or or much much more fun if you're a little kid. <laughs> My son does like that aspect. Too. As a walker, I am frustrated by that. So I guess for me, that's another positive of the planter strips. Even with tight curb lines, it creates a more walkable. I, I would echo that and- Or sorry, tight, tight lot sizes, um, not tight curb We even have some of that on College Avenue and, and Stanley would probably point out that the reasons we have that, even though we have the wide sidewalks, is it's to get the cars off of the street quicker. So we're not, and so for instance, our driveway here, to College Place, to the City Hall, the, the whole section of 10 feet drops down into that flat section. Um, and so when we were building the Cars Project, I walked um, for the, the first year, I didn't have as much time the second year on the last phase, but every day I walked on my lunch hour uh, just to kind of do my own inspection when I had time and provide feedback to, to staff. Uh, but it, it was, I would be looking around at all of the things that are going on and maybe I was looking out for traffic or whatever and when I would sometimes I would hit that drop not expecting it and you know I'm young I'm healthy and it would catch me off guard and I, there were a couple times where I, I stumbled and that's you know for anybody that is not stable you know that's a fall mm -hmm. and it's intended to be ADA compliant right. uh, but not safe really um, and certainly if you're in a wheelchair that constant up and down I mean it's like driving down a bumpy road or driving over speed bumps right. so yeah we're on the same page Mr. Green please thank you for your patience thank you um, so to the point you just discussed about the depressions along sidewalks another factor is um, 
on College Avenue, on North College Avenue, for example, well, North and South College Avenue, parts of C Street, there are places where the lot is actually below the street grade. So that's another factor in these, but I agree that generally with a planter strip that you have less of this roller coaster effect as you travel along the sidewalk, which yes, is indeed very hazardous per se. You know, a lot of people who are not as well balanced or young and healthy like to walk our sidewalks and they ought to be able to do that in a safe manner. Um, a point that on the tour that struck me was what I thought about when I was planning to move back here. So I went to college here in the early 1970s then and lived in different parts of the country for a number of years and moved back here in the early 1990s. And as I was, but when I grew up in western Washington, we would visit Walla Walla every couple of years and we would stay in the vicinity of Estrella and Bonzella near Alvarado Terrace. And I, I grew to really love that part of Walla Walla as a young boy. And when I was preparing to move back here, I thought, what is it that makes me generally really like the residential neighborhoods of Walla Walla and think they're much more beautiful than most of the residential neighborhoods of College Place? And as I thought about it, it had to do with the planter strips and the, street and the tree canopies. And there are relatively few streets in College Place that have a tree canopy, one of which is Northeast Ash, but much of it doesn't have sidewalks. Um, and, and so just the aesthetic and what has happened with those neighborhoods over some of those neighborhoods that we went through I think one of the plats you shared with us was from the 1870s I mean some of them are literally 140 some years old and yet most of those neighborhoods have done really well over all those many many decades including huge changes in the economy big huge changes in transportation because a whole lot of those neighborhoods were laid out before automobiles existed or when they were very scarce. So yet those neighborhoods laid out way back then have continued to be very successful through all these changes. And I think we can design for the future by looking at what's been successful from the past. For those of you who haven't seen it yet, um, I really encourage you to read Riley Club's op-ed in the Union Bulletin a few weeks ago. And he talks about enjoying walking through old neighborhoods of Walla Walla and the different housing types. Like, I encourage you to walk or bicycle down Palouse Street, for example. There are courts, that is, little cottages set back from the street. There are big, gigantic mansions. There are modest-sized bungalows. It's not all the same lot size. It's not all the same development standard. And as far as I know, Palouse Street never went through blight through the Great Depression or World War II or the aftermath of the war or anything like that. I think it's possible to have a variety of housing types in a neighborhood and have the neighborhood be successful over a very long span of time. Mr. Chair, I think that's an excellent transition to maybe some specific questions that we'd like to, to, to pose to you. And um, by way of, of context, a, a, a couple of comments. Based on the comprehensive plan, we've proceeded with updating the development regulations with a series of assumptions. And I want to review some of those real quickly just to give us the context for the, the discussion of the specific questions. One of them is, is that the development regulations currently provide for subdivisions, which is the creation of five or more lots, short plats, which is the creation of four or fewer lots, and that there is an alternative approach to short planning known as a planned unit development, which at least in theory is to provide opportunities for more innovative approaches and more flexibility in design. According with the comprehensive plan, we are proceeding on the assumption that the alternative provisions allowed under the PUD would go away and there would be one set of standards for subdivisions. And then there, and, and, and so whatever that is going to be, whether it's going to be a single set of standards with uniformity, or whether there's going to be some flexibility as allowed under PUDs, or variances, whatever the case, there will be just subdivisions. 
or just short plats, but not an alternative universe. There will be one. So that's kind of a key distinction. We are also talking about, and we can certainly reserve the right that after we get to the very end of the discussion, go back and re-examine some of the assumptions, but one of the things that we're looking at is, is a series of revisions that would raise the short plats from four to nine, which is a lot under state law. The advantage of that and the thought behind that is, is to provide some greater flexibility in terms of how smaller developments occur and to provide potentially a greater range of housing choices and options as the comprehensive plan said, but to do it within, on a smaller scale, so do it within short plats. So there could be some flexibility, greater flexibility in standards on developments up to nine housing units. And so we were, we were looking at potentially raising the allowance there and calling the subdivision 10 or more. So that is a, another kind of context, and we can come back and, and revisit that. So as we're having a discussion, one thing to think about, and we may ask for clarification is, are we talking about a standard that would be applicable across the board? Short plats, subdivisions, regardless of the size, or are we talking about standards that would only be applicable to short plats or only be applicable to to subdivisions are only applicable to binding site plans, and we could kind of flag some of those areas as, as we go through it. We wanted to start tonight by talking primarily about subdivisions. And we can have some additional discussion, as, as Stanley suggested, talking about the, what, you know, the benefits and desirabilities of different, you know, uses and, and, and things and particularly that would be in the, in the case of College Place with respect to infill development because much of College Place is already built out. But we wanted to start with subdivisions because subdivisions by their nature are going to affect the development of large parcels of land and those larger parcels can have a significant impact on community character. And there are two or the potential based on the current uh, city limits and urban growth area, there is potential for two or three significant subdivisions in the future. Not that there won't be more, but certainly the McKiernan Christensen one, which could have several hundred housing units in it, would have a significant impact on the community. Potentially the, the, the vacant area that we saw over on Pepper Bridge in the the Hare Brothers. the Hare Brothers property could have you know significant impact on the, the future character of the community. And there is that area that is up on the bench above the Martin Airfield um, that is accessible through the homestead. But that there's about 18 acres there that could be added in the future. So there's at least three larger scale subdivisions that we have, um, um, you know, the potential for in the community. And so the two things that we wanted to talk about in particular had to do with street standards and with lot standards. And what I found is is that the development of, of residential subdivisions in particular is really like an, a, an equation with a whole bunch of variables. And they all, you know, some will have an effect this way, some will have an effect this way, but at the end, the question is, is it going to pencil out? Is it going to be viable? What kind of impact is it going to have on community character and sustainability and things like that? So there are factors, just like you discussed earlier, frontage requirements, how wide lots are across the front, how wide can driveways be will end up affecting things like whether there's room to park on the streets, which ends up affecting how wide are the streets, which ends up affecting how big the lots can be, and which can end up affecting affordability, which can end up affecting maintenance. And so you know, all these different variables come into play, but we're going to try to break them into some pieces. And the pieces we want to talk about are these two. 
Originally, I was thinking of starting with the lot standards, but since there was so much discussion about the, the street-related standards, I thought, well, let's just go ahead and continue that discussion. So a couple of things uh, we met with is the Johnson Robert again, the, the city engineer today, to go over a number of things. And um, the one, I think the good news may be that the city requirements today and how they relate to some of the things that we were reacting favorably to on the trip are not that far off. And so I wanted to highlight some of that for you. Right now, once again, if, if we take PUDs out of the equation, the city standards are all streets will have sidewalks on both sides. So that's the standard today. So if we put in, for instance, into the subdivision regulations, a clear statement that says all new streets will have sidewalks on both sides, that's a continuation of what you've been doing today. That does not represent a change. If we include a provision that says all streets shall include a planter strip between the curb and the sidewalk, whatever the width is, and if we go on to say such things, and it shall be landscaped, or it shall have grass, or it shall include at least one tree, that would be a new standard. And we saw examples of on one side, or both sides, or not at all, but if the requirement is that there shall be a planning strip, then that would be a new requirement. As I mentioned, the stormwater is regulations are going to be something that will come along with all of this and may kind of affect some, some changes, but we do have to think about how stormwater is, is going to be managed, and that does have a bearing on some things. If, for instance, they will, why not slope the, the, uh, the streets and, and the landscaping so that it can collect stormwater and, and biofiltrate it. There might be some advantages to that, but there might be some trade-offs and things like, as John mentioned earlier, trees don't like to sit in standing water. And so if we want to uh, try to incorporate stormwater management into landscaping strips, one of the things we'll have to think about is how do street trees fit into that equation. Let's see. Um, another um, requirement as it exists today is, make sure I have this, this correct, is that arterials, there are two categories of arterials, and there's, well, let me back up, there are five categories of roads, principal arterials, minor arterials, major collectors, minor collectors, and city streets. So, John, make sure I'm saying this correctly. Arterials do not permit direct driveway access in the case of subdivisions. So if you are a subdivision and it's an arterial, then you have to, there has to be either a, a, a collector or a city street. This, this says principal arterial. Right, there's principal yeah. arterial and minor arterial. Yeah, right. And so the, the, and the, the regulations that we have drafted are not necessarily in alignment with what has been your practice today. The practice right now is that either class of arterial does not permit driveways. Correct. Another provision is that collector streets require a bike lane now and unless there's a reason why not to have a, a, a bike lane. Right. Um, but do the arterials require that too? The arterials, John, do not do it. Is that I? It depends on whether or not it, if it was if it's a bike route, then then they could end up having uh, or bike lanes or. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Bike lanes are required on arterials, not required on our. Or bike lanes are required on collectors, not required on arterials, not required on local streets. So it's collectors. Okay. Right. Now, there may be instances where the city is designating bike routes that is independent of the subdivision process. Now we're talking about subdivisions and creation of new lots. There might be a desire to have a bike route from the school to a city park, but that's going to be addressed through 
means other than a subdivision, unless there happens to be a subdivision on the route or something like that. Okay. So many of the provisions that we've been discussing are already in place. And so the, the, what we wanted to check in and see with you, are there other provisions or standards based on what you've seen that really stick out and should we consider? And the principal one, based on the discussion, is I think the planning strips. Now, there ultimately will end up being a lot of detail about the da 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 But the basic policy question is, should there be, should planner strips be required? All right, let's start at the top. I've been scribbling some notes as you've been <laughs> sharing with us. So um, I think the first one's the easiest one. You talked about the direction is to eliminate the PUDs. And I know that I'm on board with that. I believe the rest of the commission is. So if you're not, speak up now. Yes. And that's what the comprehensive plan says. So we're acting consistent with the plan. All right. So we already have that direction in place. Yes. All okay. right. Well, we're moving on then. Unless well, we, I, I see some anxious bodies. Well, Dennis, Dennis was shaking his head no. Yes. About the yes no. <laughs> no. Is there a reason why not? Well, I live in one. In fact, it was mentioned earlier uh, in Garrison Creek Villages that it's quiet. It's, there's wider. It's a straight line through there on with sidewalks on both sides on Garrison, and that's a private road, mostly except for a couple of circles. But anyway, uh, and then the rest of the the development is made up of wide streets with no. No uh, sidewalks at all, but they're not missed there because people don't drive real fast through that area. Hmm. You can walk through there very easily. However, if your neighborhood was built today, then the only change that would truly have to be made in your neighborhood is you'd have to have sidewalks on both sides of the street. True. That's in reality. That's pretty much the, the biggest change. So. Hmm. And, and and also in reality is your neighborhood, are, we're talking Garrison Creek, right? Right. Okay. Garrison Creek has very few lots that are under 7,000 square feet. So removing the PUD would not have truly affected your neighborhood at all. It could still be in this in the same way that it is because the lot size is, is, the, is the number one PUD factor getting down to in the other PUD in our town that's causing problems is 3,600 square foot lots. Imagine your neighborhood with 3,600 square foot lots even without the sidewalks and what kind of a mess you would have. So that's that's really the, the factor here is in the PUD the only true thing that we're going to change in that PUD structure is not allowing below a certain amount of square foot lots. Other than that, everything else is already kind or, of in place. Or we're at least going to talk about that. That's going to be what's in this discussion. Right. Is going to be those things that affect the, the layout of the lots, the frontage requirements, the minimum lot size requirements, some of those things. That's going to be in this part of the discussion. Right. And I say we can reserve the right to come back based on something here and say, well, wait a minute, now that I more about it, I want to alter, but for, for this purpose right here, what we're talking about is maintaining the requirements for sidewalks on both sides, adding a requirement that there be a planter strip, and the way that it is written now, and one of you expressed this as you know, the concern about maintenance responsibility, but the way that it is written now, it says that the maintenance of the planter strips is the continuing responsibility of the budding property owner unless an alternative method is approved by the city such as an, a um, contract by a homeowner's association with a professional landscaping firm or something like that. But otherwise, it's the responsibility of the joint property owner is typically how it is done, and that's how it's reflected in the, the working draft that we have right now. Back to you. Did you have a comment? I thought I saw some. I, I just wanted a little discussion on what we'd lose by, by uh, omitting PDs, and I'm content. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on that? 
I think, I think the majority of us, sorry, are in, in, in on board on that direction. Okay, so I don't know if we want to actually, the next note I had was increasing the short class from four to nine, so subdivisions would be 10 plus, and if we're gonna mm -hmm. talk about lot standards later, maybe yeah. we'll come back to that. Yeah. Okay, and then it follows then with the separate process for short class versus subdivisions are all mm -hmm. in one. So let, let's go ahead and talk about the street standards, and I know that none of these standards that we have right now include uh, planter strips, none of them. Right. And so I feel strongly that in both collectors and arterials of any classification, prime, minor, whatever, collectors and arterials should have planter strips. Thoughts from my colleagues? Hmm. Totally agree. Does that include streets? No, not city streets, just the collectors and the arterials. The city streets are within the subdivision, the, the actual res residentials? Right. Now, just because you don't require it doesn't mean it can't happen. It's just not going to be a, a yeah. city policy that it has to have it, whether you like it or not. But collectors and above. Collectors, collectors and above yeah. is what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Are the top to four that. categories yeah. of streets. John, correct me if I'm wrong. Right now, the requirement is that all streets have a sidewalk but no streets are required to have planter strips right now. I would like to even see in the, the verbiage of it that planter strips are encouraged in the city streets because I agree with Mr. Duncan. I believe that, that the planters in the city streets and Alvarado Terrace is a perfect example of it, lends to a much higher quality of a street. That's just my opinion. So clarification on semantics. When you say city streets, yeah. you're talking local streets or residential streets. Right, residential streets, right. And okay. encouraged, I think, would be a good, but I do believe the others should be a, just a flat mandate. Any, any new subdivisions should, arterials and collectors must have planners. That's my opinion. I am in so lock step with you. yes. What is, um, I'm trying to think of streets now. In the Tremont area, which are considered streets, which are the collectors, is, do you have a street? Is that considered a collector? Is that considered minor arterial? Do you have that on the street? Street? Like street? A street, Tremont. Or C? A street in Tremont uh, is a, that's a neighborhood street or local, local residential. Yeah. Is, is Whitman considered a collector? Whit Whitman is considered a, a major collector. Okay. Uh, for from west of College Avenue, and it's a minor collector east of College Avenue. And so in that neighborhood, we have no north-south collectors of any kind. Then they're all just city streets. We have a, um, in Ash. Ash is considered a major collector from Fourth to C Street. John, could you uh, you go bring the side map up? Yeah, up, just up a little bit, so we, up, you know, I want to see McCarran Christensen because what this would mean is for McCarran Christensen, since college is an arterial, that there would be a sidewalk on college, mm -hmm. and there would likely be one um, um, collector in the McCarran and Christian development, which would then have sidewalks on both sides, but then any of the other residential streets in the development with houses running around would not have the requirement then for planter strips. Yeah, the map I had up was a graph of, and I, I probably didn't have. Is the, the, yeah, the final version of the street map says that there would be at least one collector through the McCarran and Christian development, but that the, the rest of it uh, would likely be served by local streets unless based on the nature of the development it met standards for a higher level. So you're saying there's, there's a, a, a east-west collector that butts into college? Yes, and that would have then the planter strips on both sides, but the rest 
it, it could be encouraged but not be required. I do want to say one more thing when it comes to streets. Mr. Duncan, two or three meetings ago, maybe even longer, made a comment that has stuck in my brain, and that's that straight on uh, streets tend to get awful boring, and they tend to not have any character of, of any kind, and I think everything from College Avenue to Larch is a very good example of that. However, Garrison Heights has a nice little meandering, <coughs> Century is a nice meandering street. I don't think we should be so rigid that we can't allow a nice meandering street so that our neighborhoods have some character to them. Yeah, and it helps to slow the traffic as well. It does yeah. help to slow yeah. the traffic as well. That's true. And we also have the provision in the comprehensive plan that says if there are going to be cul-de-sacs, there has to be provisions for pedestrian connections so that we're not creating the need for long <coughs> circuitous routes, um, um, but that, that cul-de-sacs are generally discouraged if we're looking for a freer flow of, of, of traffic. So we could certainly add language that says things like meanders in the subdivision standards would be encouraged. Um, well, and the reality is, is we got a we got a fairly diverse topography in our in our community. You know, we've got some lowlands and we got some highlands. Um, to our uh, what's the street next to Lampuri that goes west? Majonier is a perfect example of it. Even the, you know, Majonier goes way up and then it comes back down again, and then you get it flows away from both sides. So. It just can't block structure all of our neighbor, all of our community. It's just not possible, mm -hmm. for one thing. And it would look really funky if you tried. So I like to meander in things better. Mm -hmm. um, do we want, we mentioned the, the planting strips. Do we want to throw in there the requirement that there be street trees? Yeah, I think that's part of the planning strip. Okay. In, in I, my opinion, I, agree. I also <laughs> realized that we would deviate from that standard for or modify that standard for stormwater aspects, but yeah, mm -hmm. to me those go hand in hand. <coughs> street trees, planter strips. I would recommend that the local streets also have the planting strips and the, and the street trees um, in future developments. Uh, one, it uh, will likely play into our ability to treat uh, stormwater um, as well. And, and I just strongly believe that it, it contributes to the yeah, I, I agree with you, and I am also wanting to be sensitive of our, we're going to talk about this later, but affordable housing yeah. and how that increases yeah. the, the cost of the developments. So I, I'm, I'm open on that, but. Once you make that requirement, then you're going to have to figure out what type of trees and who's responsible for, for you know, acquiring which trees whether I want to plant a, an oak there or somebody wants to plant a maple, how is that determined? The, the park board actually yeah. is working on a street tree list, um, and it's, it's largely based on what Walla Walla has adopted, and it's, there are factors that determine, uh, so in the older neighborhoods, if you have overhead power line, first off, you, you're, you're required to get a permit, I believe it's free, at least the last time I planned a tree, it was free. Um, but, uh, and then there's uh, certain trees are allowed to be planted and based on the width of the planting strip, also based on whether or not there's overhead power lines. Um, I would hope we're gonna allow I overhead that, power those lines. Those were, those were the, the <laughs> basics. Yeah, we won't have the problem in new yeah. but, but you don't want a, you don't want a blue spruce sitting next to the, tr the street either. I mean, no. it just doesn't work. Right. Oh well, you don't want yeah. a you don't want one of these you know trees that gets gigantic in a four foot plant mm -hmm. right there. So, yeah, because it's gonna look yeah. Yeah. Like well the, unless it's gigantic, fifteen feet in the air, then nobody cares. The other so issue is the process. root systems. Yep. Well, then keep the sidewalk in the street. Keep the right. sidewalk and, and yep. cause mm -hmm. other issues. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, getting the right tree in the right planter strip has been a struggle. So for I, I think you know if you're going to require trees, but it's easily accomplished. 
once that is in, in place. Mm. And it's not very limiting. I mean, there's at least a dozen trees for each of five categories for the city of Walla So you've got quick math, 60 trees to choose from there, depending on what kind of strip or, or over the power lines uh, for straight. The other issue of that is how wide is your, your planning strip to be mm -hmm. in relation to the sidewalk and how much, you know, are you t taking up the, the property owner's land? Yes, it's a good point. I don't think it's a showstopper. Mm -hmm. well, let's add something to the discussion. I want to talk about parking, but I think in order to have a kind of meaningful discussion about parking, we need to start to talk about some of the lot standards. Mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's kind of a relationship between the, the width of the lot, the width of the driveway, and whether there's parking available. I jump back on standard tree standards for one more thing, and that's the bike lanes. I see that it's required only for the collectors, and I'm fine with it not being required for the residential as local city streets. That's, mm -hmm. that's understandable. It seems to me that it should be included in the arterials. Uh, that's the location where they're at the most risk. Uh, it seems to be the direction of the national standards. So why can you infill, can you fill me in on why that isn't already included? And, and then I'll hammer on you why you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think a lot of it, been dealing with limited right away. Um, we've also toyed around with the idea of uh, using Sharrows. And it's my understanding that that was taking some traction, but TIB is not a big fan of it. Mm -hmm. And so when you're trying to appease the granting agencies, you try to do things that they like. So I, I, it, it probably should be a, a standard when building you know, new arterials where we have... Which is very rare, right? Yeah. Um, we don't have any planned new arterials. We have, uh, so the McCarran Christensen as a major collector that we go through it, so that, you know, we want bike lanes in the road on that, especially if there's a possibility of, let's say, a school out on that end of town somewhere in the future. Um, Seems to me that at that same time, then College Avenue, at least at that end, where the McCarran Christensen thing is should have a bike lane on it, and, and you know we might we probably have room to bring for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you know look, I'm hopeful that TIB will get over the their concerns about Sharrows. It seems like other communities across the country are using them, so we could put those reminders basically in place in areas like on College Avenue where it's narrow, but it's also a bike route. And, um, and Rose Street, uh, and just have those in place as a reminder. John Wood, if in the in the case of College Avenue, where we have a, a potential subdivision which could trigger a requirement for bike lanes, if that was the city standard, if that was paid for by the developer, would TIB still have an, you know, an opinion or exercise some? Uh, impact over that decision? You're saying if like the, the major collector through? No, I'm saying that on, if, if the city were to require a bike lane on college in conjunction with McKinney Christensen, if it was, if the bike lane was put in by the developers as part of their development. Yeah, I don't think TIV has an issue with bike lanes. They have an issue with sheriffs. Okay. Um, and even the use of sheriffs, it's a local decision. Um, but if you're trying to get money from the agency, then you might want to. And you want, and you want to define the sheriff so that we all have a. So a sheriff is, uh, you know, the, the chevron symbols. Uh, 
they're placed on the road along with the bicycle symbol, and that's to represent that the road is a bike route, and it's also a road, a street, but for vehicles, and so you're sharing the road with bicycles. Um, yeah, share road, share, share road. road mm -hmm. Share road, yeah. As opposed to a dedicated and marked bike lane. Right. And with College Avenue being reconstructed recently, the, the opportunity for TIB grants there, I would assume, is right. well, unless you have something in mind. No, <laughs> no, and we certainly don't want to take away uh, parking from the economic development side of it. Um, well, I'm not hearing anything that indicates that uh, staff is opposed to incorporating bike lanes in future arterial development. Is that correct? I'm not. No. Okay. I, and I don't so think, let's. I don't think Robert is either. Are we thinking that is appropriate? I was shocked we didn't already have it. So yes, I'm totally for expecting arterials to have bike lights. Well, so arterial would seem to be reasonable to have a bike lane. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like we have consensus. And I think we're hoping that we grow big enough to where we we'll need a new arterial eventually. Right. <laughs> so. Thank you for letting me jump back. Yep. No, appreciate that. Lead us into the last yep. thing. So, with respect to the creation of new lots, then there are a number of standards that also come in, into play. One is density, the, pot the potential number of lots that can be created, which we typically express in the terms of dwelling units per acre. And so, in the single family, residential zones, the density is currently expressed as four to seven units per acre. And, um, and so it, it sets a maximum level. But there's another factor which is minimum lot size. Mm -hmm. And right now the minimum lot size for a subdivision is 6,000 square feet. And if you do the math, seven times 6,000 is 42,000 is just under an acre. So the math kind of works because in a single family development, you're not going to get seven dwelling units the acre because you have to make allowances for streets and sidewalks and planting strips and bike lanes and, and all those things. So the, the minimum lot size can come into play. And in um, you know, some communities, they set a density and don't establish a minimum lot size. In some communities, they have a, dens a, minimum, a density and a minimum lot size. And that's one of the things that we've had a number of discussions about because the, one of the principal things that a PUD did was maintain the density but eliminated the minimum lot size requirement, which is how you could end up with then a number of smaller lots. So the question is, if we eliminate PUDs, do we allow for some degree of variation in lot sizes in a subdivision, or do we say that a subdivision shall consist of 6,000 square foot lots? And so, Part of the discussion earlier was about things like diversity, breaking things up a little bit, some different choices, some different feels, some different looks, or is there a minimum standard that you shouldn't go below? And there's no right or wrong answer to that, there's just different answers to that. What we've put into the draft to kind of save a place for the discussion is that, and that there's no rhyme or reason other than just numbers out of, an air, out of the air. We said that up to 25% of the lots in a subdivision could be less than the 6,000 square feet. And we said that the frontage requirement is 60 feet in all cases. So that means you're going to have, uh, these lots are going to be 60 by 100, all of them. But if the, under that scenario, then up to 25% could vary from that. 
But instead of saying that you could vary in any way you want, which is an option, we, for discussion purposes, we said, what if we limit the variation to 25%? Which means that you couldn't have a lot smaller than 4,500, mm -hmm. and you couldn't have a lot narrower than 45 feet, but that would only apply to 25% of the lots. Now, those are all assumptions, those are all variables. That's what we wanted to have a discussion of and then I think you can see immediately how that factors in and affect things like parking, because if we allow skinnier lots, there's less space for parking. Um, so that's one factor. If we don't have a standard, then we're like the PUDs, where you can have then a lot of small lots. If we say that the standard is a standard, then there's no variance, then you're gonna have a lot of uniformity. And so there's a lot of room within that to proceed. That's why also we've made a, a distinction potentially on the short plat and subdivision side and the thought is maybe to allow more flexibility with, reflect, re, reflect with respect to short plats to maybe allow for a higher degree of consistency in subdivisions. Um, but that's another variable and we'll talk about that Say more. That, again, I didn't follow oh, that we would potentially allow more flexibility in short plats that you wouldn't have, for instance, a minimum lot size on a short plat because you're only talking about four, five, six lots. But in return, a much higher degree of conformity on the subdivision side. You, gotcha. you, but to clarify that, you still would apply a density. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's not a free for us, but there's more no flexibility. Yeah, you might have a larger lot and a smaller lot as opposed to two lots exactly the same size. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's, like I said, there's a whole bunch of parameters in there, but we wanted to get that out onto the table to get a sense of where you were leaning, because that will help us to, to how we proceed and what the ripple effect is. I would like to encourage the, the idea of the short plat going to at least nine, minimum of nine, or maximum of nine. Uh, there is a, a short plat of that nature on Fern Street in Walla. And I think, you know, they've done a, a nice job of separating those lots, those facilities. So and I see that as providing more flexibility toward the, the PUC, PUD idea than just doing uniformity in a subdivision. And so I'm concerned about the subdivision being that uniform. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because you have a you know, lock step block, a um, thousand feet, whatever it is, and everything's the same. And if you have a developer that comes in and has three or four uh, floor plans, then you have all the houses the same. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that we're talking about the minimums, so there's nothing, we're not, we're not capping so a developer could say maybe they want to provide lots that will be suitable for ranch style houses so maybe you end up with a, a hundred foot wide frontage mm -hmm. and it's only 60 feet deep um, too so there are mm -hmm. other ways or you could go you know you could have a 7,000 square foot lot and a six foot and, you know the sink view uh, division is, is if you go through there and look that was all platted at 50 feet yeah. But the particular property that I had was actually 75 feet, mm -hmm. and some of them were yeah, 100 yeah, feet. So they divided it up as they, they went through. So that possibility is there. Mm -hmm. But it's still pretty much standard yeah. step. Two of the things that I thought from the tour that really struck out in my mind was, one, in one of the older classic neighborhoods in Walla Walla with the trees lined streets and everything they just looked beautiful but they were actually really small houses yep. the, the 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 size of the lot and the size of the house is kind of overshadowed by the things you just talked about the yep. character of the neighborhood was established by this not by lot sizes now having said that then getting over into um, um, the the, um, Hayden, the yeah the Hayden Homes development where they're just 
wasn't any room because you have all small lots. There just wasn't any room to park. It just had a very, very, very different feel to it. There it definitely the size of the lot and the size of the house made a different. And what I had there was the impression of the houses that were basically a garage with a little door off to the side. Which is very, very different than the, than the neighborhoods that, that you so fondly remember. So those are some, some variables, but we really wanted to get at this question of is your vision that subdivisions should have a, a, a consistent standard lot size or should there be some room for variation and if so how much room and maybe 25 percent is too much uh, maybe it should be 20 percent um, i mean you know if if 25 percent gets you a 4500 square foot lot and, and much narrower streetscape maybe that's not acceptable based on what we've seen you know out of the homestead development where i think we have the smallest 3,600 and only a 50 foot. Yeah. So I don't want to just take it to talk too much. So <laughs> I'm going to let you direct, but I'm ready to speak when you're ready to, for me to. <laughs> okay. Brian, any thoughts? No. Not at the no? Scott, Dennis? I've, <clears throat> it seems to me, based on what I've lived in and what I've seen, the Green Park Division, particularly on, on Lynch and, and those over on the west side, were all basically 50-foot lots. Further in, you have larger houses, and whether that was actually Platted, I'm trying to remember and looking at the plants. If those were 50 foot and they just went ahead and, and built on three or four of the lots. I know that happened in Scenic View. And you're trying to, to maintain a 6,000 foot lot. I'm wondering if 5,000 is too small. Okay. <laughs> Well, if Monty wants to talk first, I'm going to. The lot I was on was was 120 deep and originally platted at 50. They moved to it enough to get 75, which made 75 for the next one. But the, the lot that was next to me at the time was vacant. Developers came in and they actually built on the 50 on that one and the other one was a corner. So they had two two properties that were 50 they built on. So you had the, the full 50 and they couldn't get the, the, uh, the double garage on a 50. You can barely get it on 75. I'm just, you know, I'm trying to, to, to if we set a standard of 6,000, does that give us enough for a double garage? Or can we move back to the 50 and then let them spread out as they wish? Right now, the, the driveway standard is at the, at, the, at the street, it's 20 feet in width, and there's some allowance as you go back onto the property that it can widen a little bit up to 24, I guess. Is that John? Yeah. But it's, but it's 20, so 20, so if you have 60, you're going to have 20 of that in driveway, and, and unless you change the standard. So if it gets smaller, then you get you know, the, the smaller area. And what's the separation between driveways? Oh, uh, I want to say it's a couple of feet. Is that it? And, it? and that's, you know, you end up really with that whole rock mm -hmm. situation. Yeah, you're not even getting the full height in a couple feet, so you're... Well, I think, I think it's total four feet. So if, if you have a setback of two feet for the... For the lot line? You might call it out in the standards that you have there, but I think there's a four-foot panel before, this, before the leaves. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. 
So, and we allow the driveways to be, to go up two feet on the wings, so that gives you a 24 foot wide actual driveway on your property. But the bottom of the driveway, the flat part of the hill, mm -hmm. is 20 feet, and then the wings go up four feet. You know, how much space is required for each parking space on the street? Roughly 20 feet. Yeah. So a 60 foot width would give driveway plus two parking spots? Generally speaking. Mm -hmm. 50 well, would be a... It would probably be one, and the reason I say that is because you're going to have a setback from the driveway to the property line, mm -hmm. so there's several feet wasted on that side, mm -hmm. then you'll have your 20 foot driveway, and then you'll have the rest of your lot. And so getting, you know, if, you know in an ideal world, you'd have 40 feet. That's right. But right? in reality, but it's... the reality is you'd have less. Yeah. less. And so you, you have like one and a half, well, it's really going to be one. Because unless you got a motorcycle or and depending or on the, how the driveways are spaced, right. you could pick up an every extra one every so often. Yeah, if they're opposite sides, right? yes. yeah, and they're yes. together. But then you're going to have it's possible. You're going to have the pop-ups. You're, right. you're going to have the hydrants, the parking, parking, mm -hmm. and so you, you start to lose <laughs> yeah. stuff here. So where I'm heading is, uh, is there a difference in parking between a 50 and a 60 foot lot, or between a 60 oh, yeah. and a 70? Yeah. Uh, yeah, when you get below 60 and it starts to really, the uh, driveway starts to that big, big time. So, I mean, it, you know, if, if you want to provide flexibility um, in the lot widths, I think you have to up the standards for how wide a driveway can be. You have to limit the, the width of the driveways. And they they try to do that in, in, the, in the Hayden Homes, and so if you go down, the street, what street was that? Really? Carver. Carver. You'll notice uh, that the first few houses that they built in there on those narrow lots had single car garages. So the driveways are about 12 to 15 feet wide. Mm -hmm. But those products, they're cute, but they didn't sell. So then they said, oh, well, let's do the two car garage. And now you end up with in my opinion, a very unattractive product because it's mostly garage and less parking available. So it just... A front door in a garage. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we were... It was a battle um, with the parking. And I mean, it still is. I want to hear from Dennis if he has any comments, and then I know Mr. Green does. I have a few. Ken's been patiently waiting, I thank you. I'll keep waiting. No and problem. I do want to wrap up in 20 minutes. Yes. So Good. now that uh, I've established what we'll be doing, <laughs> that is cool. I can see where you're coming from. We have a, a double garage, double car garage, with just, I think there's a 10 foot uh, easement across across the front of all those lots. The PV, public yeah. utility easement, yeah. Uh, but that's only a 6,000 square foot lot. Yeah, and your neighborhood only has, for the most part, parking on one side. Because they're, they're 20 That's right. wide streets. That's right. And as I pointed out on the field trip, there is a parking problem there. Uh, we get calls all the time, but I, I believe that most of their parking problem is due to their restrict their their self-imposed restrictions in that neighborhood. Driveways. They don't allow, well, one, a lot of them don't have driveways. If you have a driveway. Um, but many of them don't have driveways, but also they don't allow parking in driveways overnight, and they don't allow parking on the streets overnight. That's right. Mm -hmm. And they only have one uh, parking lot for the community that actually is not even part of the development because it's on an undeveloped phase. Uh, so it's, I mean, it is within the development, but will likely go away at some point. And that, that's a real that has, problem. Too. That has what probably seven to ten cars in it mm -hmm. at a given time, um, or, so, or pickups or something. A lot of people have a third vehicle. Yeah. Mr. Green. Thank you. I'll be brief. So, contrasting Alvarado Terrace and Carver Street over in the Homestead subdivision. So, Alvarado Terrace. Most of those blocks have alleys and it was built with carriage houses in the back, and I will note that many of those carriage houses now have apartments upstairs, but on Alvarado Terrace, you have a relatively narrow 
asphalt. You have relatively wide planting strips. Um, you have different lot sizes on one side of the street, small homes on relatively small lots. On the other side, big mansions on big lots. Um, what struck me on the tour down Carver Street, my bicycle down that street before, is you have a wide, fairly wide width of impervious surface that doesn't have a lot of transportation demand going on, but also, unfortunately, is not very effective for storing very many vehicles. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge waste of space not being used for landscaping and causing more runoff. Um, so it's, it's, in my opinion, a really poor design for a long list of reasons. I don't think it's so terrible on a local residential street that doesn't have a lot of true motor vehicle traffic that on those rare occasions when two automobiles are facing each other for one of them to pull over to the right in front of a driveway while the other one gets by. I don't think you need freeway width. That, in other words, if there's a car parked on both sides, I don't think you necessarily need two full lanes of traffic in between the parked cars if, if there's a relatively low motor vehicle traffic volume. Mm -hmm. I, I will echo that. Yeah the comment about allowing for narrower streets that still have parking on both sides where you can have the chicane and cars have to pull over them. I will caveat that with you will, the fire department will bite that tooth and nail. Yeah. And just, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm support, I'll, I'll go down that road and battle it with you if you want, but. Yeah, we have also felt at times yeah. that the fire department directs the width of our streets. So I, I agree that it's going to be a maybe insurmountable obstacle. And, and, then, and yeah. sorry, and the point about a lot of wasted, impervious, uh, expensive street that's not put to much use at all is, is yeah. very valid. And yeah. I appreciate you raising that point. Sorry. Um, also, I point out the, the Alvarado Terrace, the, the ones that don't have alley access, they, they do not have two car garages on the front of those homes there. If they have a driveway at all, it's, a, it's probably 12 feet wide and it may even be shared. It goes in between two homes and goes back to a garage or a carriage house that's in the backyard. Not, but you know, those, are, those are products that uh, are not being produced and mass marketed in our community. I'll share my two cents and I'll, I'll turn it over to Ken who will now correct me when I'm wrong, right? <laughs> so I, I like the idea of having some flexibility in the lot sizes in a subdivision. I, th I think that the cookie cutter aspect is not something that we're shooting for mm -hmm. and having the lot size flexibility will get away from that stencil uh, development. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what those thresholds are, you know, 20%, 25%. Uh, but I do like the general direction of that. And you think, would you be leaving it up to the Planning Commission then to decide? I think that we do need to establish uh, a minimum, or, or I guess a maximum, of what those number of lots would be and a minimum lot size. Uh, I think that needs to be established for, for guidance for the developers, not to, not to leave that up. Because that would be a standard yes. then that would say, when you're designing your subdivision, you have to do this. Yeah, so I'm, I would be looking yeah. for help from this panel to determine what those appropriate and staff too absolutely I mean but yeah I think we need to we need to establish that as part of our responsibility. Um, and now I'm gonna upset Ken. I don't have a, a passion against really small lots. I, I will not choose to live there myself. And I I I like the idea at least of letting the free market decide what a sellable lot is. I want to be sensitive to um, affordable housing. I know that smaller lot size, at least in part, contributes to that availability. Um, I, I don't want to incorporate that in that small um, 3,000 square foot lot size in a greater subdivision that has uh, R60 or R72 minimum. I don't want to intermix that. I don't think that's appropriate. But having maybe a fuller development of very small lots. I, I could get there. All right, that, that's my two cents. Mm -hmm. I, I'm actually on straight. the same line. However, I'm gonna throw another caveat into something else we had planned on talking tonight was affordable housing. 
I believe if you're going to play with this three, four thousand square foot lot size, it ought to be mandated. They only are used in affordable housing situations. Mm -hmm. Tiny houses is a great example. You could have a three thousand square foot lot, and you'd have a nice one bedroom, two bathroom, one bedroom, one bathroom, or two bedroom, one bathroom house. Very easy. If anybody's looked at at tiny house models, sometimes they even have one of the bedrooms upstairs. And you, you kind of walk behind the kitchen cabinets and you walk up the stairs and you got a whole master's suite up there. And it's kind of <laughs> neat looking, you know. So to me, the only time you drip, drop below the 6,000 square foot is for affordable housing. And I also noticed in our, our little thing here, we also had a little co comment about mobile homes. And I think that the mobile home parks ought to be allowed to go below that state same standard, even if they're on found permanent foundations. Um, I don't remember the names of the streets. They're on the corner of Lamperty and College College um, Avenue. There's that whole section of mm -hmm. mob, mobile homes. There's no reason why a mobile home has to always have 6,000 square foot. Okay, affordable housing. That's a really neat idea when we're not talking about affordable housing and i'd like the market to kind of do its own thing but unfortunately we get into these large corporations that all they do is they want to go to the 3600 square foot lot so they can build a three-story house and, and charge somebody an extra amount of dollars for a super tiny lot you know and I, I hate to say it but business is about money they're going to make money the best way they possibly can and the smaller they get the lots the better but John, what did you call that the, when they just build a little house behind for a, they used to call them mother-in-law houses. Yeah, 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 yeah. ADU. Yeah. 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 You want know, to have it large enough for an yeah. accessory unit. Um, we just mentioned here about uh, uh, two uh, car garages. You give a 5,000 square foot lot, you're not going to put a two car garage on there fairly easily. Not only that, but not only you're not going to put a two car garage, but you're if you get one car on the street, you're going to be lucky, you know, unless you got a smart car, then it's going to fit. So, you know, we do need a minimum front lottage size. I'm sorry, but we need on a regular planning section, even a 6,000 square foot lot is small. Consider the average four bedroom, two bathroom house that's 3,200 square foot. It's half a lot. You can't put that on a 3,600 square foot lot. You're not going to put it on a 6,000 square foot lot very easily either because there's just not enough room, unless, of course, you go a basement and, and up. But you know what? I'm sorry. Today's economy, uh, today's market, people don't want basements. They don't want upstairs either. They want single level houses. So we got to be a, a little bit flexible in every direction. Instead of saying we're going to have a set, just a set, a, set, a, a lot size of 6,000 square feet, we also need to say we're going to have it have no less than a 60 foot frontage road or a front on the road as well, because you need that space. I'd love to see us go to seven, 70 feet minimum. Um, and I would like to see them say, to say another minimum if you're going to have a triple car garage. So I could put three car garage on a, on a 60 foot thing, but like you said, you're gonna hide the house. You know, <laughs> all you're gonna see is garage. So go ahead and I can go. Just one little thing to tack onto that. It seems like maybe we could, we could uh, tie a lot with the number of, uh, or with the driveway. So a ratio of one to three, for example, if you have a 60 foot uh, lot size at the street, then you're allowed two. If you have a 90 foot, you'd be allowed three. If you have less than a 60, you'd be constrained to a one. Is it possible to do something like that? Uh, it would allow the smaller lot sizes, but, but still create the atmosphere that we want, the part on street parking that we want. Yeah, I think, I think you could apply a ratio of, of percentage or whatever mm -hmm. that would, if your lot's this wide, well, then you only get a 12 foot wide right away. If it's this wide, you get a 20. If it's yeah. this wide, yeah. you need to put a cap on it because it's I right. Someone will come along and try to build a five-car garage across the front of the house. <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> the more garage space, the better. And then you go two levels up. So that's sure, the point. Let me add one other variable to the discussion. We're not going to resolve it tonight, but let me add it and, and invite you to think about it, and we'll pick up the discussion at the, at the next meeting, which is just to, 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 to build on Ken's comment. 
if we allow your, uh, density of seven dwelling units to the acre is just about 6,000 square foot lots. So if we allow less than 6,000 square foot lots, then what that means is, is that there's either going to be some compensating larger lots or there's going to be more open space. Unless there is a provision for a density bonus, which was another feature that PUDs have. And the rationale for a bonus typically is to provide an economic incentive for someone to do something that they otherwise wouldn't do. And so a couple of potential incentives, one would be to provide a, a density bonus if you're going to allow, um, um, if you're going to have, you know, allow a density bonus, but the compensation for the bonus is you have to increase the amount of open space you provide or increase the level of park improvements that you provide. The rationale being if you have a density bonus, it means necess out of necessity you're going to have smaller lots, you're going to have smaller lots, there's going to be a greater need for recreation someplace else. So that might be a quid pro quo. Another one, arguably along the line that Ken would think was, is that you could allow density bonuses in instances where provisions are made for more affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Now, you get into a little bit of a challenge, not impossible because many communities have dealt with this, but affordable housing on the home ownership side is a different equation than affordable housing on the rental side. And on the home ownership side, if you're gonna give somebody a benefit like we're letting you build more lots in return for affordable housing, well, how do you define affordable and for how long and how do you regulate that? And so if you make the house, you know, lower in cost, it's more affordable. Now are you limiting who can buy it or can anybody buy it? And if I buy a lower cost house, does it, can I buy it and hold it for a year and then turn around and sell it for a bunch of money? So, there's, so there are some trade-offs in there, but those are potentially two areas. Some communities have said, well, we'll give density bonuses for um, increased provisions for public arts, for enhanced pedestrian amenities, uh, for greener development, so you, you can kind of see some you know, on the fringes, but parks or affordable housing might be a couple. So one of the things to th add into this, should there be provisions for a density bonus, or should we just say the density is this and mean the density is this? Because one of the things, that you could also argue, somebody hears the word bonus and they don't hear the word bonus, they mean what I'm entitled to is now more. And so there's some dynamics within that. So that might be a good place for us to pick up the discussion because if you allow more density, in theory, you're allowing more affordable housing because you have more units to spread the fixed costs against. So that might be a great transition to continue the discussion and then we would go on to talk about affordable housing. Just, I think with this discussion now, you can see what a little bit of our rationale behind in talking about short plats, maybe allowing some greater flexibility and not saying, for instance, lots have to be 6,000 square foot. Since we know there's not gonna be you know, more than four or more than nine, maybe that's a good way of allowing some flexibility and allowing as long as the density set this lot's bigger this one's smaller you have some clusters or some shared open space or some cottage type developments there's a number of different options you can you can have there so we'll we'll keep down the path and be thinking about affordable housing but one of the things that i heard you say in a previous discussion was you also wanted to talk about strategies for improving the quality of the housing and, and the, the, the quality of development in the community. And so that's why we wanted to kind of start with subdivisions because that's the most significant way of potentially doing that. So we've got, I think, some pretty good guidance out of today's discussion, but we obviously we need to continue at the next meeting, which does bring up one logistical question, the third Tuesday in November. 
is right before Thanksgiving. Is right before Thanksgiving, and we need to check to make sure that we would have enough of you here to have a meeting. I travel that week, I know. I mean, I'll be in town, but mm -hmm. I will be leaving to the area on Wednesday. Uh, yeah, so that's, and I could be here, so that would be... My only issue is I have surgery on the second. So the chances of me being up and around that quick, I, I'm not going to guarantee. I'll be in a cast a minimum of six weeks. Um, we, so. we can make provisions for you to call in as well if you would like. And okay. you, you can access board docs from home. So you can see yeah. Well, I'm, I will attempt, but, and, and honestly, I could care less which day you guys choose, but the 13th would be the week before, and that might be diff very difficult for me to make, but I just don't know yet. I might be up in two days and not have any problems at all. I don't so know. So the 13th is not an option because we have a council meeting that night. Oh, uh, well, they don't have to have a meeting. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's an option. We, we don't have to have a meeting. I mean, it, um, but then we should make sure fine. Uh, December 18th would be the next, which do we have a similar problem with yeah. Christmas and Christmas? Yeah, it's getting close. Uh, the Christmas Eve is Monday the 24th. There's, there's so something about November more. where the, the third Tuesday can be the same week as the fourth Thursday, but. I'm sure if I looked at the calendar, it would make sense. Yeah. So, generally speaking, it just looks like a thumbs up or yeah. on 20th works for me. The 20th? It's okay for Brian. It's okay. 20th? 20th of November? I think so, yeah. Dennis? <laughs> Sounds like 20th. Great. I, just, I just have one comment just in case I don't get to be here, which I probably will on the 20th, but even so. We have already decided as a planning council to try and keep everything that we do fairly simple. So even in this process, I think the KISS rule really needs to be very important to us. We don't want to get so egregious on these regulations that they're hard to get through. You know, let's just make a basic uh, lot size rec recommendation and, and call it quits. You know, we put too many variables in it and it's just going to get ridiculous. So what I'm hearing is you're not in favor of having the flexibility of different lot sizes within a certain density. I don't like I, honestly I think the density stuff is just it, it just mashes my brain and I hate it right. so uh, no I'm not in, I'm not into density issues I just want to go with a lot size and be done with it minimum minimum lot size and let them work it out in the end are you willing to summarize what you've written on your notes I'm not sure I can read them all there and I'd yes. like to go through that real quickly and then we'll wrap up um, with respect to street standards what I heard was sidewalks um, on all streets as a continuation, that there would be planter strips on collectors and arterials. Um, um, planters would be encouraged on local streets. Um, we would have can you, can you stop right there? Yeah. I would like to come back to that when we talk about affordable housing. I like that. Let's, let's plan okay. some. So we'll put a, a we, we can, I think generally we can have the, the provision of a kind of a, an affordable housing, housing caveat, but we'll put one right there. Thank you, John. That's like it. And that uh, bike lanes would be required on collectors and arterials. Um, with re and 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 I made a note. Something we didn't talk about. That this is a note to me here is to talk about the timing of when sidewalks are required. Because one of you talked about you know having. A development and there were sidewalks but then there was a gap and things like that and at least one of the stops we made on the door it was a subdivision where the sidewalks were being installed when the lot sold and that and it developed as opposed to when the street was put in and there is a difference there and so I may know that we'll come back and talk about that with respect to um, the lot standards the discussion is ongoing um, some of the factors that are considered is whether we would allow smaller lots as a trade-off for affordable housing, that there might be a basis for some kind of standard where
the um, lot width would be the basis for determining the number of cars in the garage or the driveway width. And also I will add that we've also been talking about the need or the benefit of the, the KISS standard, which is we try to keep things simple and- Stupid. Yes, <laughs> and, and I can say as one who, who writes these, that oftentimes you start with something simple and you, so it is a good reminder um, to, to us in that regard. And then we pick up the discussion next time talking about um, um, bonuses, talking about the lot sizes, and then we would go to the short plats and then continue the um, um, affordable housing into some of the innovative options like um, um, accessory dwelling units and the like. Accessory One question, since we're, we're focusing down on residential, are we saying there is no zoning anymore because zoning was based on sizes? Yeah, no, the zoning, the, the, there is, there is the single family residential, which right now is a 6,000 square foot lot size unless there's an agreement to change. So any area in the yellow, it's a minimum of 6,000 square feet and the density is, is up to um, seven dwelling units, but as a practical matter with a 6,000 square foot lot size will not be seven. And then um, there's a density requirement to the multifamily areas, um, um, but there are, are no minimum lot sizes because you potentially have you know much different configuration. So no, the zoning is definitely in place or remains in place. But only for for residential, in terms of subdivisions. Are you thinking R60, R72, R96? Yeah. Yeah, no, there's, there, there's a single family zone. Okay. And right now the standard is 6,000 square foot lot. Okay. You have to have at least that. You can have more, but you have to have at least 6,000. And part of the discussion would be, would there be any circumstances in, under which you'd entertain anything less than a 6,000 square foot lot? The simplest standard would be 6,000 is the minimum, and that's the minimum. Monty, do you, Walla Walla has gone to one residential zone as well or they're going to it. Do you know what their minimum lot size is? No, I do not. And I don't know that that action has been taken yet. I do know they are trying to do that, I guess. Okay. Yeah, to eliminate. I thought they went, I thought they, when they adopted the comprehensive plan, 